Hi, everybody. Welcome. So glad you're joining us for the first of our leadership uh, best practices session. I am excited to welcome Kevin Lau. He uh, is going to talk about agent training and retention and onboarding and uh, all of those good things. Uh, Kevin is Senior Partner Enablement Manager at Google TV. Perhaps more importantly, he is a huge hockey fan, an even bigger fan of Detroit. This is the first time I've seen you where you haven't had your Detroit t-shirt on. And he also uh, introduced me to Ted Lasso. I had no idea about this. It was all news to me. <laughs> so thank you, Kevin. I, I already learned a lot and we haven't even started. That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for joining. I know that people are probably rolling in here. It is 10 a.m., uh, 10 to 1 a.m. Pacific here on the West Coast here in San Jose, California. I'm happy to be with you all. Uh, this session is being recorded uh, for those of you who can't make it. But um, for those of you that are, are in this room, uh, would love to get some engagement from you. Uh, please use the chat function that's available on Zoom. I'll be actively monitoring that. Um, so if something uh, strikes you as uh, interesting or funny, like if something's funny, go ahead and type in aha, or if something's like, oh, that's interesting. Um, something along those lines uh, to, to let me know that you're there on the other side of the screen. I was mentioning to uh, the team here that I really wish we could do this in person and hopefully one day uh, we can, but until then, hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Uh, just a quick background on me before I jump in. Uh, I've been with Google for just over 10 years, uh, focusing on, on our Google TV platform. It's a new uh, streaming platform that we have here that organizes all of your entertainment apps into one, into one place. So you can seamlessly and effortlessly uh, watch your favorite content at home with a little help from Google. Uh, with that said, though, prior to this role, I worked a lot in call centers. I was actually a sales, uh, sales executive. I managed those who sold, and I trained uh, channel sales teams um, who resold Google products. And some of the stuff well, will be learnings from that experience, and I'm excited to share that information with you. Uh, with that said, I'll, I do want to start off with a quick story. Um, I'm a big proponent of of you know the, the fact that there is there's a difference between leaders and managers. Um, it's our responsibility as leaders to not just be in charge, but to take care of those in our charge. And the, one of the ways we do that is uh, obviously you know through onboarding uh, and making sure that our newer agents are effectively onboarded in a way so that they can be as successful as possible sooner rather than later. Uh, this picture here, um, this is a very a generic generic picture, but uh, my, one of my first managers at Google actually showed this to me uh, uh, in our first ever like one-on-one. -on -one. And at Google, we have one-on-ones with our associates every week. No, no questions asked. Like that is, a, that is a standard practice that we have accordingly. And I hope you deploy something like that in your, in your own organizations. But um, he showed a picture like this uh, and he asked me to look at it. And he, you know, I, you know, he's like, hey, tell me what you see. And I said, hey, well, I see... Uh, Two, you know, in this case, the two, two Detroit football people uh, running, Detroit Lions, uh, running towards uh, number 33. And there's a person here, and I can put the pointer up here. There's a person here that is uh, blocking, right? And then this is the person with the ball. And when I took a look at this picture, he pointed to me and he goes, this is you. You've got the ball, you know, and this is me. My job is to block and pay, pave the way for you. Uh, and we are a two-person pod. And I, that conversation happened 10 years ago. And I still remember it to this day. And I'm reminded every time I look at a picture like this, whenever I see football on a Sunday, I'm reminded that you know, it's our job as leaders and managers to pave the way and eliminate roadblocks for our, for our team and find ways to ensure that they feel empowered and they have all the tools and know-how and the knowledge and the confidence to do their job effectively and confidently every single day. You know, with that said, um, you know, there are three points that we're going to discuss today in this quick 40 minutes that I have with you all. Uh, we're going to talk about coaching. Uh, we're going to talk about rewards. And then we're going to talk about, about leadership. And so let's jump, let's jump right in. 
so coaching and as sage mentioned like i'm a big ted lasso fan and this is not a paid advertisement or anything but definitely definitely uh check it out it's available on apple tv plus uh so coaching uh frequency value and velocity so let's let's talk about this so um when I think of this, I think of three buckets. And by the way, it should be, it should be frequency, value, and community. I'll change that here. But uh, frequency, okay. How often are you coaching? Next, value. Like, what is the value that the person on receiving that coaching is getting after it? And then community. So I changed this from velocity, like literally a few, few days ago. But community, uh, I think of coaching as a communal effort. And so the question there is, how do we share the workload? And I'll dive into what I mean by this. So frequency. Let's talk about frequency. Uh, how often is it happening? Well, you're attending this workshop today. It's Tuesday. Uh, there. And uh, the question becomes, hey, what are you going to take from this whole week of, of training and talks? What are you going to do to implement this? Are you going to implement it tomorrow? Are you going to implement it Friday? Like, eh, you know, let's, let's do this again. On, let's just try this out on Monday. Monday is a great day to reset things. Uh, my team took a different approach with regards to to execution of learnings and training. And we did it more, we did it more in real time. Um, the way that we structured our, our team is that we had team meetings. We had a team meeting every Monday. It probably you probably do something similar in your in your place where you huddle together for maybe 10, 15, maybe 30 minutes to talk about the week ahead. And then uh, call shadowing occurs. So uh, every week we're tasked with hey, four to five associates, you know, it's your job to to coach them up throughout the week. And then at the end of the week, um, it's important to look back, like understand, hey, what are the what are the wins? One of the team, one of the things that we did as a team often, and I look back, is that we celebrated everything. We the smallest of wins, the largest of wins, um, because if you can carry that momentum into the weekend, uh, that obviously sets everybody up for success that way. But then what we found is that they're actually even more eager to get back after it uh, on Monday, and. So, you know, if, if what you just saw is a little bit foreign to you, I encourage you to, to give it a shot. Um, the other thing is um, value, right? Like, so we talked about, hey, like how often we should be coaching our associates. Like, let's talk about the value in which uh, we, we provide. Uh, often, and I'm, 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 I'm guilty of this, of this doing this too. Uh, let's say that you're shadowing a call, which we typically in your position, we typically do, right? Uh, you're shadowing a call. And you find a couple really good things that that person did on the call, whether the intro, the agenda setting, uh, something on those lines, right? But then, because they're new or maybe they're a junior sales rep, you start thinking about all the things they they didn't do well in that call. Uh, and then this typically, this last like five or six things that you wrote down on your piece of paper, this is typically where we spend a lot of our time coaching and providing feedback to that support agent, and it's a rinse, rinse and repeat. It's a rinse and repeat cycle where we're always like focusing on these five or six things at any given time. What we found at Google and what I found in, in working with direct teams is that uh, this approach is not really effective. Um, in fact, the way that the better way to do this is to actually focus on maybe one or two things like prior to, prioritize the, the top two things that that agent or that associate can actually do to improve uh, their, their conversations with, with customers or their approach, uh, whether it's demeanor or what they say or their confidence level, and just stick with those two things and still, until you see marked improvement uh, moving forward. Next is community, right? So uh, it's a lot of pressure. And I don't know if you feel this way, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on the chat. Um, there's a lot of pressure, I think, on managers and leaders to shoulder the lift, shoulder the load on coaching. Uh, I was meeting with uh, one of my clients recently, and they empower their managers to do a lot of the coaching on the floor. They don't really have a dedicated learning and development staff that does this on the ground. And so that takes a lot of work. Uh, and the, the, with that being said, you know, I've heard people say this in different circles, but the, the, the theme is typically, hey, we need to build a customer service culture or in a sales capacity, we need to build a sales culture. And when you think of what a customer service cult, a customer service culture is, you probably think of a lot of, you know, words and phrases that come to mind. I'd love to hear what you think when you see the phrase "we need to build a customer service culture." What do you think that means? What do you think that means as a group? I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
on the chat. Okay, those of you a little shy this morning, that's perfectly fine. But when I think of customer service culture, you know, I think of, I think of, you know, treating people how we want to be treated. I like that, like we're customer focused, right? Um, treating advisors like we do treat customers. I like that one a lot. Uh, the, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like, you know, I think, I don't know if it's stereotypes, if this, this is the wrong word, but there's a lot of like things we think of when we think of customer service culture. What I encourage we all, all, all of us to, to think is that we don't need to build a customer service culture. We need to build a culture that drives service. And I think when you think about it in that lens, you know, the world starts to open up a little bit. Uh, you know, being able to provide or create an atmosphere where folks can bring them, bring them their whole selves to work uh, when they're able to contribute to that culture because they feel that they have purpose. Um, when we're providing, again, education and training so that they're confident in having conversations with customers on the line, you know, those are things that, for, that I think resound well you know, for frontline agents and I think uh, can make all the difference. And so uh, the, the mandate here is like, hey, let, we need to build a customer service culture, cool, but let's think about it as we need to build a culture that drives service. And I think when you reframe that in your head, there could be an opportunity there where you can maybe see the roadblocks uh, that are preventing that culture from being born. So for discussion, and if we were in a room together, uh, I'd probably go round table and ask, of, ask folks to, to ruminate on these three questions. Uh, how can you be more frequent in your coaching cadence? What value does on-the-job coaching have on the customer experience? And lastly, how can we share a workload and build a culture that drives great experiences? Uh, the last one is, is probably the more challenging one. That, they, that, that That's not going to be built in a day uh, or a week or a month or a quarter, but um, how do we build a culture that enables great experiences for, for and enables our people to provide great experiences uh, for others? And I think there's countless examples of organizations who do this on a day-to-day, -day, but I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well. It's good to reflect on these type of questions. All right, let's jump into the next part. So rewards, it's it, incentives to drive, drive great experiences. Um, with that said, you know, I think, you know, it would be great, I think, if people could do the job, you know, without, without incentives, right? Like, it would be really nice, you know, if folks could say, hey, like, hey, just, just do a great job. And that's it. Well, you know, we live in a world where there are carrots and sticks, you know, that there are people that, that are motivated by things outside of, uh, outside of just themselves, you know, and uh, there's opportunities to, to do more there. Uh, typically, what we find in terms of recognition is that, hey, the leadership or us in this room, we say, hey, let's incentivize everybody. Everybody gets the same incentive. And then what happens is that only the top 20% uh, actually get rewarded. And, uh, and this, this, is, this is true for both sales and for support teams. I've seen this across the board, no matter how large or small the team is, there's a certain percentage of people who will do the job and do it, do it really well. And typically that's 20% of the, of the folks there. The opportunity here is that we can rethink how we incentivize and motivate everyone on the team and not just some people. One idea I heard is about finding maybe the most improved team member and each of in each of, of, of in each of in each of the, the latter. So let me let me give you let me paint this a picture for you. So I talked about hey, talked about hey, that only 20 20 percent get rewarded. What if we restructure it in a way where hey, let's reward the top performers, right? We still need to do that. We need to keep our great people great. Find ways to recognize the middle group of performers, right? So those that are maybe not at the top but also not at the bottom. And then lastly, finding opportunities to motivate maybe your bottom performers. And I think this is the challenge that everyone faces, regardless of industry, regardless of the product or service that they're providing. And what I want to show here is that you know, Simon Sinek recently talked about this, and he calls it rewarding momentum. And so I do want to show a quick clip here that kind of illustrates an idea of what something like this, this could look like. The metrics that we have 
are not wrong. They're just incomplete, right? The way the standard met metrics that we have to measure our own success in, in our companies, profits and revenues, EBITDA, whatever you want to use, and the standard metrics we use to measure our own wealth, there's nothing wrong with those. They're just incomplete. That's like saying, you know, when I chose to marry her, um, she's really good looking. Important. <laughs> and is she a good person? Does she bring the best out in me? You know? Um, how is she in times of stress? Like, will she look after me? Will I look after her? Will she let me help her? You know? In other words, there's more to it, and it's the same for businesses. So what, I've, I, what I'm learning to do is to understand those balancing metrics. So I'm now very interested in things like momentum, right? Where I want to measure momentum as much as I want to measure accomplishment or, or sheer numbers. So for example, the traditional way in which we measure, this is, this is really funny, this is an inside joke you won't get. Can I have that um, pad if you still have it back there, please? Or not, never mind. The traditional. There was a whole debate before, I don't need the pad, I don't need the pad. And they said, we'll keep it here in case you need it. I'm like, no, I don't need it. No, I need it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'll just do a visual thing. So the way we traditionally measure um, uh, success is we give someone a goal, right? We say, meet this financial goal. And then what we do is, ah! You You're the best. <laughs> So here's what we do. We give somebody a financial goal, we say, hit that goal, right? And what we do is we don't, we don't know how they got there, right? They beg, borrow, and steal. The morale on their team is, if they're doing well, it's high. When they're doing badly, it's really low. They can't hold on to employees or team members. They keep quitting or getting fired. And it's kind of a mad dash. And then on the right day, on the right time, they hit the goal, and we give that person a bonus. <laughs> There's another person who's building a team Morale is really good all the time, whether it's good times or bad. Uh, performance is not crazy highs or lows. It's just the steady growth. Um, the team gets along great. And at the end of the financial year, that's where they end up and they miss their goal. We don't give that person a bonus. And so what I'm starting to pay attention to is momentum, right? And how we got somewhere. Clearly, clearly this person's going to hit their goal in 16 months or 17 months. But to the rest of the organization, we told them, don't do this. We told the rest of the organization, do this. So what ends up happening is we are incentivizing behavior that's actually bad for the organization and bad for the team, because we make this the end all be all. So what I'm considering is not just were they able to hit the goal, but how, how is the momentum? And in reality, I want not to give this person a bonus, and I want to give this person a bonus because whatever they're doing, I want them to do more of that. Because in long term, this is way more valuable to my company than this. And it's same with my own life. Like, I'm starting to think in terms of momentum. So it doesn't, I don't really care what my book sales are. I genuinely don't care. What I care about, does it keep selling? Because what that means is my message is relevant enough that there's still demand for it with no marketing. I'm not out there hawking it. Because I know if I turn up the marketing dial, I'll see the numbers go up. I want to see, can it sustain itself? So, so unlike a lot of other people in my business, you can become an Amazon number one bestseller. It's really easy. You get all of your friends to buy the book in the same hour because the algorithm recalculates every hour. And you can launch your own little self-published book, get all of your friends to bed, and in your category, you'll be number one. And for the rest of your life, you're a number one Amazon bestseller. I had no idea that that was actually the case, by the way. I, I was thinking about, hey, should I write a book? Uh, and I didn't know that that was the case. Um, there's a, this, this clip is, is really good. It goes into like, how do you go about doing this? I'll send it. Well, it'll be, you know, hopefully it'll be part of, uh, of materials afterwards. But I'm curious. I'm going to shut up for a little bit because um, I want to hear you. There's how many people in this room? Like 20 of you in this room. I would love to hear what your thoughts are on, on what you just saw. The metrics that we have are not Feel free to, to jump into the chat. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep, absolutely. The, the revolving door, as some, as some people put it, right? Any other thoughts there? I wish we were in a room so I can see your faces, but we're here. As you're pondering uh, your, your uh, emotion to that video, uh, there's some questions here that, that I think is good to reflect on. Um, what improvements can we make uh, to the current incentive plan, regardless of what that looks like? 
uh, how do we reward and recognize groups other than just the top performers? Uh, what steps can we take to appreciate our frontline teams more regularly? Uh, one of the items we did is that instead of incentivizing the end result, like Simon just mentioned, uh, we incentivized behavior. We incentivized the actions that, that would lead someone to get from where they are today to where we want them to be uh, tomorrow. And so we gamified our, our CRM system uh, to be able to quantify the key performance metrics that we wanted to see, whether it's number of calls, call time, uh, hold time, and other key metrics that are not necessarily the end result, but indicate that they're making progress and providing a great, a great, a great experience. Yeah, this one, the mad dash creates a lot of stress and morale can really suffer in the long run. Correct, right? If the mad dash also creates a lot of just like anxiety. Uh, I think stress, is, stress and anxiety probably go hand in hand there, but the, the ability like every three months or every month you're having to like push something moving forward, right? If you can find ways to sustain that over a longer period of time, um, I think there's ways for you to uncover what momentum looks like for your, for your business. And yeah, great point here, Megan. Uh, momentum is a sign of success, moving in the right direction. Yeah, that should matter on the team. And unfortunately, you know, in my experience, uh, it's hard to recognize that. It's hard to recognize uh, folks that are doing the right things that will eventually make them successful. And, event and, and for some reason, one reason or another, they're not, they're not successful yet. They're not, they haven't hit that mark uh, just yet. So, uh, so yeah, no, this is, these, are, these are great thoughts. These are great thoughts. All right, the last bucket here is leadership. Uh, what we do and how, and how we do it. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share this clip here. How many of you in the room, and I wish I could like, see hands, have had a manager that kind of looked like this? Someone who's like always in the back room. We call it the back room manager. One of my first experiences, I was actually working in retail, so it wasn't a call center environment. But I was working in retail. I worked at the Women's Express. Women's Express, folding clothes, hanging clothes. That was my job. And I vividly remember having a manager that would just sit in the back room the entire time. Just sit there and would rarely come out. Um, and so I remember that. And then I, I remember working in a sales function. I worked for the Chicago Blackhawks uh, when I first get in, got my career started. And I remember having a manager. Uh, who just sat in their office all the time and would only come out if something was on fire or if something, something needed to be actioned right away. Uh, and I remember that, right? Um, and my, the philosophy here that I'm trying to provide, and I've been in my career now for 15 years, is that we should all strive to be the leader that we wish we had. And with that said, you know, uh, I believe leadership equals visibility. And at Google, uh, we found that there's actually a number of different attributes that make a, a leader successful uh, when it comes to not just onboarding and training, but just for the overall lifespan, right, um, of their career at, at that organization. So there are like, there are six things. One is show support. I think, uh, you know, whether it's good times or in bad, um, being a two person, being in a two person pod, right, I think that's, that's incredibly important. Uh, be timely in feedback. Uh, this is a this is one that we could probably do a whole module on, by the way, uh, focusing on on feedback in a timely manner. Uh, often, what I see in organizations is that when you see something that is may, maybe missed the mark or didn't quite land so well uh, with uh, with a, with a customer on the other line, we'll we'll often wait. We'll wait to provide that that feedback to that person maybe in our next one on one. Uh, which is maybe a week from now. And that doesn't really have the same effect as if you address it spot on, you know, right away. Folks need to understand exactly when and where they can improve uh, as soon as possible. And I think if finding ways to do that is, is, is incredibly important. Roll up your sleeves. Uh, this one, I, 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 I kind of lean into a little bit more heavy than the other ones. I, uh, for me to provide feedback to others, I feel that I can't really do that if I am not doing the job myself. When I was working with uh, our, some of our call center teams at Google, uh, it was a novel idea to put 
my desk out on the floor and sit and do the job with the team that I was managing. It was novel. It was a novel idea. I would pick up the phone and I would do the job. I would sit on the inbound line and field customer questions and field, field issues. Uh, I would jump on the, on the sales line and cold call uh, uh, potential customers and prospects. And I, I, the really cool thing that happened here, you know, looking back is that uh, my feedback was actually um, regarded as, as more authentic because they're like, oh, wait a minute. They're not sitting in the back room. They're actually doing the job that I'm doing. And they're, they're, they're seeing the challenges. They're seeing the successes just as much as I am. Oh, maybe this person has something I, that I can learn from. And for me, being visible and actually doing the job um, is, is incredibly important. The question for you all, you know, as you're watching this, is like, when was the last time you did the job that your team was doing, is doing currently? Like when was the last time you picked up the phone or sat on an inbound line or did the job for a full day and just get an understanding of how that workflow goes? Uh, you'd be surprised to see what you'd, what, what you, what you'd be finding in that, in that regard. And I think, again, finding ways to improve that experience, whether it's from a knowledge base set or from a, from a structure or from a process point, I think there's a lot of things you can uncover there. Be an advocate. Uh, at Google, I know that I can trust my manager to be in my corner, you know? And I think when we talk about leadership and being visible, it's, being, it's, a, it's about being there and helping to showcase your team's um, progress and doing that for everyone on your team. Now, some of us have probably managed large call centers and large customer care centers on a daily basis. And that's, and so to be an advocate for every single one on the team can be, can be challenging, but I challenge you all you know, to find maybe five folks. So that's one a day. Find, find five folks. Maybe you're not your top performers, but someone who's doing the job and doing a job really well. It may not end up on a score sheet or on the, on the bonus announcements that happen at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter. Uh, but if you're finding ways to, to uplift those around you, especially those that may not see uh, the top of that, of that, uh, of that, I guess, like the hierarchy or at least the, the, the sales board or the customer service board, whatever you have to measure uh, success and progression within your organization, find, find time to do that. And, I, and watch and see how, how that elevates the, the culture and the team and how that translates to better uh, customer interactions. Encourage dialogue. We talked about this at the beginning here, but the team that I ran at Google, we fostered dialogue both ways. Um, we ensured that we, we obviously got our message across. These are things, these are goals that we have. These are calls from the top down that we need to execute on, but we wanted to make sure that we were positioning our teams for success. We wanted to make sure that we we're giving them all the tools, knowledge, and resources to make sure that they can actually execute on the goals that we set out for ourselves. And so one of the ways we did that is by having regular meetings to talk about not just our successes, but talk about, hey, what's, what's really challenging? And some of you are probably sitting there, yeah, when we do that, you know what? It's, <laughs> it, it turns into a, a venting fest where people are starting to unload their baggage in front of everyone. Obviously, we need to mitigate those situations, but providing avenues, in front of providing good channels for people to provide their feedback as to what's working well, what can be improved. You'd be surprised what some of these folks can provide in terms of uh, areas for improvement, innovation, uh, so on and so forth. And so encouraging dialogue is, is not on, it's not on them. It's on us as leaders uh, to foster that dialogue and encourage a two-way communication. And going back to my first slide here about removing roadblocks. Uh, again, it's our job uh, to provide uh, some of that, to some of that, that security and some of that comfort to showcase that, Hey, someone's in my court. Um, if I have a roadblock that, that, that I'm, that I'm not being able to push through here, uh, can I turn to someone? Can I, can I be the person that can, they can turn to to help remove that, move that obstacle or that challenge? Um, so these six, I mean, this is not a, some of these you can probably say are, are, are duplicates of one another, but I think uh, for us as leaders, it's again, our job to take care of, of folks that are, that are working with customers. And some of you have noted here in the chat, it's important to, to personify or uh, 
create a, a culture within our organization so that they can provide an even better experience uh, for customers you know, moving forward. Uh, so with that said, for, for discussion, um, so for some things for food for thought for you, one, uh, how much time do you spend away from your desk in a week? Just, you know, start keeping track of what that is. Uh, when you think of the best manager I've ever had, what qualities come to mind? And conversely, when you think about the worst manager you've ever had, what did, what did you learn? Right. And, you know, I think the end of the year provides a great reflection point for folks to understand what went well, what didn't go well. And I encourage you all to think about um, the leaders in your life and how they got you to this point, what worked well, what didn't work well, and how we can, how we can better personify the leader we, we all want to be and the leader we all wish we had. And hopefully, you know, if all things come together here, uh, you, can, you, can party, you can party like this uh, with, with your team, hopefully in a, in a very near future. Cool. So to recap, um, we talked about coaching. We talked about the frequency, the value, and community and sharing the workload. We talked about rewards, the incentives to, to drive great experiences and make sure that we're incentivizing not just some people, but everyone in the pipeline. And then lastly, uh, leadership. It's what you do and how you do it. Are you staying visible? What, what can you do today to make you even more prominent and visible to your team members so they, don't, they know that you're there to support them every step of the way. These frontline associates represent your organization. They're sometimes the first point of contact for the organization. What can we do to make sure that they feel supported and confident in doing that day in and day out? With that said, I left generous time for questions and Q&A because I, I value that versus slides. And so I would love to, if you have any questions or comments or thoughts, um, drop them into the chat and maybe we can have a, a good discussion about them. Kevin, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe Thanks for having me. Let's let's watch here for a couple of um it's interesting. One of the things you said about uh supporting Myra Golden uh touched a little bit on it um yesterday, I believe, in her opening. And that was just uh one of her tips was to think about how you can make that frontline staff, how how can you make their lives easier? Like to ask yourself that question, how do I make their lives easier? Which I thought was a good way to kind of uh, frame that as well. Yeah, and one of the ways you can understand that if, if you're not getting that feedback directly from, from your team, or if, they, if you are getting that feedback and you wanna validate it, the easiest thing, and maybe for some of us, the hardest thing is to actually jump on the phone and do the job. Like I, it sounds so elementary and I hope it doesn't come across as so fundamental or so elementary, but uh, I've promised myself, and this, could, this is going to get really deep, so I apologize for a Tuesday, but I promised myself that I'll never lose sight of how difficult the job is. Talking with customers at their moment of need is a very high stakes situation, right? Now, if they have an issue of the problem, that's why they probably called. Like people nowadays would rather text they would, rather, they would rather email and wait for someone to get back to them. But if someone's picking up the phone, you know something's going down. And when was the last time you did that? And I promised myself that I'm never going to lose sight of how difficult that job is. And so because, because the job will evolve, things will evolve. So if we're doing the same things that we were doing five, 10 years ago and expect that's going to land here in 2021 going into 2022, you're sorely mistaken. Uh, the questions are probably more in depth. They probably did some research before they called. The only way to get that actionable insight is if you do the job yourself. Well, great, great. Um, we're getting some questions here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Craig, good to see you, Craig. Thanks for joining. Um, and thanks for inviting me to talk at the, on, on stage today. Craig asks, what was the most common obstacle you saw for the frontline employees that you could remove for them? Uh, I think there was automation. I think uh, easy. Uh, there was a number of just manual tasks um, that we that we saw. I remember doing a time and motion study. If you've never heard of that before, it's called a time and motion study, um, where we like analyze and and really see like how much time someone's spending on a certain task every single day. And we found out that a lot of a, a lot of the things were very much manual in nature. And so, working with leadership, we found ways to automate some of the 
some of these manual tasks to make it a little bit easier. So one of the things I saw with one of my clients is that, uh, you know, and when, when a deal was, was closed, instead of, you know, processing it through their CRM, having it send a manual email with all the information and the SOW and move forward, we were able to automate all that with one click and customize it in a way where it felt authentic and it felt real to the person receiving that, that email. And I think um, that was the biggest, one of the biggest improvements we made. Uh, Marshall, knowing how difficult the job is, yep, improvements and solutions to improve process and agents. Yep, thanks Marshall. Megan, yep, in a virtual environment, it can be challenging to get the juices flowing in group discussion sessions. Oh, I, I believe it. This can stand in the way of getting to meaningful feedback and everyone feeling comfortable to share. Consistency is the key. It is how we build a rapport and a safe pace, space to share. Absolutely. Uh, what sort of rewards, Di Dina? Dina, thanks for your question. What sort of rewards and incentives have you found to work well? Uh, I alluded to this a little bit. Let me see if I can dive, dive a little bit deeper. Uh, we called it, uh, you can steal this if you want. We called the incentives, we call it game changers. Game changers was the, the title or the theme of the incentive and because we wanted to change the game. And at this point, again, the story is, we were incentivizing all on quota attainment. We were incentivizing all on the key metrics that we wanted to follow up. And that was, that was like the end all be all. It's like, hey, hit this metrics, no matter how you do them, here you go. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, 20% of the team would just get it. They just get it. The other 80% of the team was, was struggling, right? Because they, they couldn't see what that looked like. And they were building all this anxiety internally because they were seeing their peers hit these, hit these goals. And they felt that they, they, they was so far out of reach. Like, oh my gosh, I can't, I could never hit that, that number or hit that mark. And so in terms of like what words and incentives we would do, um, I think this is a good question to like throw back on your team. Uh, Everyone is motivated in different ways. Uh, and everyone learns in different ways as well. Uh, on the motivation front, some people value time off. Some people value uh, food. Some people value uh, recognition, just rec recognition over everything versus, versus anything that's tangible. Yes, there's a money component. Uh, uh, there's swag as well, which is, which is great. Uh, there's call outs on a company all hands or a team meeting when you're recognizing someone in front of their entire, entire peer group. Uh, you can cut it in different ways, but the importance of rewards and incentives is what we're rewarding and what we're incentivizing. And so the, the idea is let's, let's find ways to motivate based on key metrics that everybody has access to. So from a sales world, you know, we knew that the number of calls someone would make, would make on a daily basis would be indicative of of how their effort was going. And we knew that the more calls they made, the more people they talked to, eventually they'll end up getting a sale. And so by incentivizing the number of calls per day, we were incentivizing the right behavior to get them closer to that, to that spot. And the customer service lens, you know, that's where you know, I'd love to learn more about how, what, what parts there, like what, what, what are the key actions that maybe don't show up at the end of the month, but key actions every day that you know will help someone get to the next point? Is it you know, the number of people they talk to? Is it uh, their satisfaction scores at the end of the call? Like what, is, what are those metrics that, that, you can, that everyone has access to move? Um, and then incentivizing, incentivizing that way. Megan, do, you yeah. ask, do you ask people how they prefer to be recognized? Yes, in one-on-ones. In one-on-ones, I think it's a, it sounds like a cop-out, but instead of us guessing, <laughs> let's, let's get it from them. You know, let's find out, hey, what motivates you? You know, what, what is it, is it uh, you know, is it time with family? Is it friends? Is it, is it sports? Is it, um, there's a plethora of different things. I mean, yeah, you know, compensation money, sure. That, that's, that's, that's obviously a, 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 the, one of the more common ones. Uh, but, you know, you'd be surprised to understand, like, there are different things that really motivate people, you know, tangible rewards or just recognition and public recognition in front of their peers to showcase that they're good at their job. People want to feel that they have purpose, especially now. Um, I can tell you, full disclosure, being here at home, talking to you all from my bedroom, I don't get the same feel of talking with other colleagues and that, that same energy, right? And 
there have been times throughout the year that where it's like, you're like, wow, like I'm feeling, the, is, am I burnt out? Am I burnt out here? Um, or have I lost my purpose? And, uh, and I think, you know, finding ways to recognize and appreciate people during this, these COVID times, I think is so much more important now than it's ever been before, especially when it comes to retention and especially when it comes to onboarding, uh, given, given the current circumstances, we've got a couple of people on my team who have joined us during the pandemic and they've disclosed to me more times than not that it's tough. It's tough. And so we need to be there for them. We need to be front and center. We need to be visible, uh, buddy systems work, but it's up to us as leaders to shoulder that load. Perfect. Any other questions? These are the feedback on the chat is awesome. Thanks so much. I feel like I'm not alone in this, in this, in this talk. This is, this is really good. Any thoughts, questions, confessions? I'm down for those too. We can do that as well. It's Tuesday. It's, it's the first week of October. We can, well, I'm here. I'm here for it. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Yeah, I like that. Listen, recognize, resolve, and reward. Yeah. The last thing I'll mention, um, it's kind of related to, 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 to onboarding and, and, and coaching and whatnot. Uh, my former director at Google uh, mentioned to me Dell's rule of five. I don't know if everyone's heard of this, but Dell's rule of five says for every five new hires you have on the team, one of them should be tagged for future leaders. The question he asked to us at one point was, if everyone, if all your leaders went away tomorrow, let's hypothetically say that's the case, who on your team could step up and lead the team? And I remember when he first said this to, to our entire group, it was like 200 people, and there was an audible silence. You, couldn't, you, you could tell that there was a lot of worry that our bench wasn't, wasn't as strong as it probably should have. Uh, and so when you're onboarding folks, when you're training them, be on the lookout for, for future leaders, like, um, because they're the ones that could, they're going to, that you can invest in that will obviously be more attentive to your training, but could be more attentive to actually shouldering the load and helping coach, helping coach other people. Kimberly, just to share, when I first started, my manager sent me an email, getting to know each other with 10 questions, pet peeves, what motivates you? How do you like to be recognized? What's your favorite food restaurant? I thought it was great. And she also answered the same questions for me. That's phenomenal. And then that backs up my thought there at Sage on, you know, asking a pointed question. How do you like to be recognized? I think that's really, I think that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Kim. That's great. Uh, I just put in the chat, Kevin, tell me if it's wrong, but I just put in the chat. Oh the yeah, link thank you. To, uh, your latest blog. Um, that I think is kind of taken off and been really popular. So if anyone wants to check that out um, and we will have, um, you know, the recording of this session and also uh, Kevin's um, slides available as well. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey, this has been great. I wish I could have could see every, you all, but um, we're all in this together. I'm a big proponent of of, of leadership and, and our role in the development and onboarding of, of new agents, just because I, I, I look back and that's how I got started. And I, there's a lot of things I wish I would have done better, uh, both as an individual contributor and as a leader. And it's been good to be able to reflect on that. So for me, doing this exercise with you all has been just as helpful for me as I hope it has been uh, for you. So thanks for the time. It's great, Kevin. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, just one more reminder for everybody, we do have our final wrap-up session that we're doing every day with Joshua Seth. That's at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, don't miss it because he's giving away free pizza and doing magic tricks and dad jokes and yeah, all the things, special effects, sound effects and everything. So it sounds like fun. Uh, it is fun. It's, it's a good time. So don't, uh, don't miss that. We'll see everybody there. Thanks again, Kevin. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.